Okay, week six, this is the second take on George Williams. Here we go. Welcome back to the Agone Institute. We're talking about George Williams, the founder of a mission, and that would have been the YMCA. And when we left last time, he had been apprenticed to a draper, textile mill owner. He had converted to faith in Christ through Evan James, uh, a faithful preacher there in Wales, and now he is beginning to move into his calling, if you will, his lifelong calling. The f if you take your next PowerPoint uh, slide and look at it, you'll see that it talks about that the first convert of his was his sister-in-law. And he immediately, after he had come to faith at that Congregational Church uh, at the response to Evan James' uh, invitation that night, he definitely began to reach out right away. He took that Andrew list that we talked about last time very seriously and began to think about it in terms of his own family first. Shortly after that, he then moved to a new draper, a new textile mill, and he began to work for Hitchcock and Rogers. He was now one of 140 young drapers, assistants, and they all lived together, usually five to a room or so. And you have to understand the day and age. They work long hours, often 16 or sometimes longer hours a day, six days a week. And because they worked so long, they would just literally walk out the door of the room where the textile mill was, and they would go into their dorm room. And it was a very, it was a very intense kind of situation living with all these other guys and working with them as well. He soon, after his arrival, took up this Andrew List concept and began to pray for people who he was hoping that, that Christ would use him to reach. And he found a couple of Christians, not many, just a couple, and the only other Christians uh, that were there they began to pray with. And he wrote in his diary, quote, We met, our number, numbers grew, and the room was so, soon crammed. In answer to prayer, the Spirit of God was present, and we had conversion after conversion. You can see very intentional methodology. You can see that they were active and that this was probably more important than anything they were doing in their lives. Soon they had to have other rooms to meet in to accommodate the scores of employees that began to show up at these, these prayer sessions. And uh, it eventually even included the firm's president, George Hitchcock who also professed a new faith in Christ. And that was at least partially what led to 12 years later in 1853 that Hitchcock allowed Williams to marry his own daughter. So you can see that Williams was very relevant, very personal in his approach, very intentional in his approach, and was living out both the methodologies the theologies, the philosophies of both Biney and Finney. Well, these drapers began to think and pray for others, and 11 others joined Williams, more than half who were converted by Williams, and they began the Young Men's Christian Association on June 4th of 1844. Now you see you see a picture here of John R. Mott in your PowerPoint presentation. And Mott was the man who became known as world citizen, and he became the heir to Williams's legacy, if you will, through the YMCA. And there were two particular conversations that Williams had with Mott later in life. And I'm, I'm going to quote both of these and sh share with you what they both were. On the first one, Mott had, had asked Williams what those men that had formed the Y in 1844, what they had hoped to accomplish. And here is Williams' response, quote, 
we had only one thing in mind, and that was to bind our little company together in order that we might the better lead our comrades to Christ, end quote. Now, think about, as, as uh, Professor Conrad has asked you to consider in, in, your, in, in your work for him in the weeks that he's teaching this course, about your purpose statement. What's your vision? What do you see at the end of all that you do as you envision your sports ministry? For Williams, the vision was those men that would be converted to Jesus Christ. That was his vision. What's your vision? Why do you exist? Why does your sports ministry exist? Here's the second quote. This came on his deathbed. His deathbed. And now Williams asked Mott the question. In kind of a faltering voice, he would have said, Mr. Mott, are you ever alone with a man that you do not talk with him about Jesus Christ? Talk about purposeful. Talk about knowing a vision. Talking about knowing how to accomplish that vision through the mission that you're on. How are we doing on that? How are you, as a, an aspiring minister of the gospel, doing on that? Well, let's pick up on, on beyond what happened there in the Draper's business. And, and now this YMCA goes on, and they begin to, to very much grow, and they're beyond just this one place. It begins to spread. And Williams begins to train others for the ministry. And this has got to be part of any model that you develop. Here are a half a dozen things or so that he said were vitally important for people who are trying to win people to Christ that he all called, that he, that he summarized in calling all of these under the title of meeting the perceived need. First one on your PowerPoint slide, don't argue with a man, but take him to supper. Take him to supper. Know men by name. If you know them by name, you'll be able to know what, what their needs are and, and how to pray for them. Write them letters. In this email day and age especially, how meaningful would it be for the people that you love and want to see come to Christ to receive a handwritten letter by you? Go for walks with them. In other words, do some leisure pursuits with them. Take them for tea. Just get together with them. Give them warm handshakes. Have warm hearts with loving souls. I think you can begin to see how, how again, that Williams grabbed these two great principles of intentionality and, and really going after people with the Andrew list, but doing it in a biny kind of way, loving, relational, thinking about what could happen if, if that person could just know that we love them. Well, the YMCA began to embody this. And your next PowerPoint slide, you'll see four different versions. A cotton mill, uh, an army Y, uh, a, a mill for those in Louisiana that were lumberjacks, a railroad YMCA, in my own community in Canton, Ohio, there was a, a YMCA built around the railroad. Very, very important as men were traveling across the country to have a place to stay where they could get away from the temptations of being on the road and surrounded by other people that would have Bible studies and positive associations. In the YMCA in Canton, Ohio, during the, the turn of the 1900s, and. Uh, 1800s into the 1900s, early 19th century, early 20th century, I'm sorry. They, they started to train men on auto mechanics because these men were coming off the farm and their perceived need was vocation. And while under the hood of a car, or if you're in England, under the bonnet of the car, the YMCA instructors would say, okay, now the spark plug and the air filter and all that, and by the way, how's your family? Oh, it's going tough. And I, I, I miss my wife and kids so much, I gotta get this training so I can get a job so I can send for them. 
meeting the perceived need of retraining the YMCA for years in Canton, Ohio, met the real need of coming to know Christ because they first met the perceived need. This is an excellent way to conceptualize your ministry. On that next PowerPoint, you'll see another key component for Williams, and that was reliable men. It was only men at that time, the Young Men's Christian Association. Here's some of his principles. He managed the men who managed the business. Now, one of the things that's a misnomer about Williams is he was never on the YMCA staff. He was always a volunteer. He always stayed in the textile mill business. That's what he did. He took over for his father-in-law. But it was often said that, that you, could, you could go by his office, and if the door was closed, you could see through the window that, that he was on his knees praying with the men. In fact, his workers loved him. He fought for shorter work weeks. He helped his workers out financially. He prayed for his workers on a daily basis. And in fact, he encouraged many of them to go into the ministry. He often paid for them to go to get seminary training. He believed in this concept of passing on to reliable men in our second time together in our devotional spiritual formation video. You remember that Timothy 2.2. This was Williams in a nutshell, passing on to reliable men. The pictures at the bottom of your PowerPoint are pictures taken of the modern day YMCA. That is the direct, direct lineage of the YMCA that he started in London at the Hitchcock and Rogers drapery business. I think he'd be sad that while they do a great job on the physical side of life, that they don't do anything spiritually. Which is another thing for us to conceptualize as we envision our 21st century ministries and models for them. What are you doing to ensure the longevity of your spiritual ministry? Okay, to wrap this up, we want to meet perceived needs. That's why sports and recreation ministries, leisure pursuit ministries are so important so that we have the opportunity to be intentional about winning people to Christ. And then to train leaders to make it bigger than ourselves. And like he said to Mott, are you ever with a young man that you do not talk about Jesus Christ? How are we doing on that one? Dr. Greg Linville for the Agone Institute. Ancient models of ministry from which we can grab hold of great theological and philosophical principles for our methodological models in the 21st century. See you next time.